I find it sometimes very uncomfortable. Sometimes I'm giving a lecture, and there's uh, somebody who's taught me. You know, one of my teachers who's taught me in maktab, in, in the local maktab, and they'll be sitting there. And uh, I find it very uncomfortable, even though, you know, sometimes they're just a hafiz of the Qur'an. But for me, that, that's very important that you respect them. In fact, I think you should feel the same respect even for your school teachers. You know, at, to some level that they've taught you something useful. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidil mursaleen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman Kathiran ila yawmiddin Amma ba'd Inshallah to continue with The advices from Allama Sha'rani About the adab of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He continues and he says Wa min adabihim ta'zimu al-ulama تعظيم العلماء وحملة القرآن الكريم محبة في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لأنهم حملة الشريعة المطهرة. So in in this one he's saying that among their etiquette and their adab and their conduct is that they are revering of the ulama, they respect and honor ulama. Ulama means people who have the knowledge of the deen and who practice that knowledge of the deen and who are encouraging others to practice and who teach others. So they have great respect for the ulama and they have great respect for anybody that carries the Qur'an. That carries the Qur'an here refers to the huffad, those who have memorized the Qur'an or who are memorizing the Qur'an. It's not just referring to somebody who's carrying the Qur'an, meaning as a book. But this is just the way that they carry the Qur'an in their hearts. It's talking about people who have memorized the Qur'an. So the ulama and those who have memorized the Qur'an, they do this out of love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because the love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa means that you love everything related to him. And because ulama are inheritors of the prophets, so they are an inheritor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لِأَنَّهُمْ حَمَلَةُ الشَّرِيعَةِ الْمُطَهَّرَةِ They are the ones who are bearing the responsibility of the pure faith, of the pure sacred law. That's why you must respect them. If you don't respect people who have the sacred law, then we're not respecting the sacred law. For our Islam to be successful, for any person's Islam to be successful, then we need to obviously respect everything related to it. Because Islam is not some kind of separate entity that has a life of its own. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a separate entity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is independent. But the sharia that he's given us is only as good for us as we make it. It has all the beauty in it. But if we don't revere the sharia, if we don't revere our sacred law, we don't respect it, we don't hold it in high esteem, we don't defend it, we don't understand it. Uh, the biggest problem with the sharia law today for most of us is that we don't understand it. We have more knowledge about other things than we have about our own deen. And then after that, we are challenged about our faith and we can't respond because we're confused ourselves. This is the case with many, many Muslims around the world. They haven't studied their deen. Their deen is just the fact that they were born into the faith, so they carry it with them based on how much they've learned from their fathers, their mothers, and maybe from some teacher when they were young. At a time when they weren't mature and they couldn't really pick up and maybe the teacher didn't do a good job maybe. So that's the extent of a lot of people's faith. So when they're challenged outside in this challenging world of this time, then they become extremely on edge. They don't know how to respond. And this is what creates a crisis in faith for many people. This is basically the crisis of faith for most people today. People who are confused about their faith. They don't have the conviction, the yaqeen. The conviction and yaqeen is lost because they never had it in the first place. New Muslims do better than many born Muslims because they've, they've, this is something that they've been seeking and they found and it's won them over. It's given them something to adopt that they didn't have before. It's provided, it's completed for them something in their mind and hearts. That's why they've taken it on. 
The rest of us have been extremely fortunate that we didn't have to do this seeking. But then we've stopped short and haven't really understood what Allah really wants from us. Unfortunately, most people's Islam is based on their culture. It's a cultural form of expression of their faith. That's what it is for most people. Not to say that culture has no place in Islam. But just cultural Islam with no Islam, with no proper Islam and no understanding of its real essence, that is a problem. But if somebody understands Islam very well and they continue to assimilate aspects of their culture that have no contradiction with their faith, then that's understandable. What you have today is two extremes. You have certain people who think that all culture has to be just dismissed, whether it's neutral aspects of our culture. Humans have culture from based on where they come from. The British would have a culture, the Indians will have a culture, the Pakistanis would have a culture, the Egyptians will have a culture, and the Senegalese people will have their culture. But Islam is something that can be enacted in all of these different places. You can't say that you can have an Islam that's devoid of any kind of culture because there will be some culture. There will have to be some culture. There will be an environment in which that Islam is practiced. And there is an allowance for that culture. And yet there's other people who are fully cultural Muslims. So much so that if they were shown a hadith that kind of that contradicts some aspect of their, their cultural Islam, they would be very, very much surprised. And they may even initially disregard that narration, thinking that this is impossible. I've been taught by my forefathers and my culture, this Islam and this Islam that you're showing me, this other Islam that you're showing me seems to be foreign. So this is the crisis of faith today for the most people, for the majority of people. Now what happens with a lot of these people who haven't understood their faith properly, and sometimes they're at edge, they are in a sensitive time of their life maybe, they are in a crisis maybe of some sort, whatever the case may be, something may have gone wrong in their faith and they're a bit, they are seeking something. Now in this particular void as such, you have these people who will come with an extreme sense of faith, saying that most of the people that you know of your faith are lazy people. They're not willing to stand up for the rights of the believers. Now remember, for a lot of people, this is vulnerable time when they feel the aggression towards them, the aggression towards the Muslims in general. So there's an opening in their hearts. They want to do something. So now you have this extremist elements that come and take advantage of this situation. So they show them that the faith that you have been following until now, the bit of faith that you've been following, this cultural faith, is not real Islam. The real Islam is taking up arms, for example. <laughs> is going and doing something for the believers that matters, that will make a difference, that will make a big bang. Making a difference means making a big bang and make a huge, huge uh, cry. This is how a lot of these people who are in this form of crisis can be taken advantage of. Whereas people who are strong in their faith, they've studied the faith from the Quran and Sunnah directly and through good scholars, then very there, there's a great that there is a very small likelihood that they will ever go to an extreme because they, the, the faith in its original form gives a great amount of strength and conviction. And that conviction is difficult to shake. It's when you don't have that strength that it becomes difficult to shake. So here just part of maintaining our faith is to respect and revere the ulama because they're the ones who are doing the job of trying to maintain the faith and explain the faith, preserving the faith. That's why he said this is the adab of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will do this. In fact, even people who may not be ulama, but they are just hafiz of the Qur'an because they're actually pres helping to preserve the Qur'an. See, in our communities, we have many, many, many huffaz of the Qur'an. So when somebody new becomes a hafiz, it's not a big deal for many of us. We think it's just another one. But this is not the... The, the normal state of people around the world. If you look in the majority of Muslim communities around the world, they don't have as many huffaz of the Qur'an as we do. And for them, if there's one half is in the family or in the community, it's such a big deal that it's such a major achievement. It's a massive achievement. And th this is just the nature of human beings that when they see too much of something, then they don't respect it as much. It's just the nature of human beings. But we need to go above that communal nature that people have. We need to do things for the sake of Allah, which means to respect what He wants us to respect. 
regardless even if there's hundreds of them around us. So we must respect our Hufad and our Ulama. The next point that he brings up is Wamin Adabihim. Again, this is just levels of Adab. He's saying also among the etiquette is La Yamuruna Rakibina Alaman Alamahum Shay Amin al Quran in Azim. Walo Saru Mim Mashaikh Lasr, Walla Yam Shuna Amama, Walla and Suna Hum in Al Hadiati was Shukri with Dua, Walla and Suna Hum in Al Hadiati was Shukri with Dua, Walla it is a Wajun Lahum Mutalaka, or Imra at Mata Anha. ولا يتولون له وظيفة عزل عزل عنها ولو سئلوا فيها لأنه أبو الروح. Now this is probably very specific to the days in which this was written, but to give it a modern understanding, saying that I'll give it the literal meaning first. He says that the adab of the people of Allah is that they do not pass by mounted. If they're on a horse or a camel or something, they will not pass by somebody who is not mounted, who's ever taught them even a bit of the Qur'an. So any teacher of theirs that they have benefited from, even in the smallest amount, they will not go past them riding. They will get off and walk past them just out of respect that they're not higher than that person. Now none of this is fard. It's not haram to ride while you know, your teacher is seated. But this is just out of respect for the person from whom you gained your knowledge. The knowledge that you gained is actually from Rasulullah through his teaching from the Sahaba. But this final connection, the tap that gave you the water, was this, this teacher of yours. So they wouldn't do this. So now in, in a modern sense, I mean, we generally don't have that kind of thing above and walking and people walking and people, you know, it's generally a matter of convenience, cars and things are accessible to one and all really. So it's just about not being in a superior state, trying not to put yourself in a higher state than somebody that you studied with. I find it sometimes very uncomfortable. Sometimes I'm giving a lecture and there's uh, somebody who's taught me, you know, one of my teachers who's taught me in maktab, in, in the local maktab and they'll be sitting there. And uh, I find it very uncomfortable even though you know, sometimes they're just the hafiz of the Qur'an. But for me, that, that's very important that you respect them. In fact, I think you should feel the same respect even for your school teachers. You know, at, to some level that they've taught you something useful. They've taught you something useful. That's why he says that this is how a person should be, that even if the person who he's speaking about has become one of the greatest scholars of the time now, but he should, still, he should still be humble in front of his teachers, even if they are of a lower status now. They are where they are, but he's grown up and he has uh, become extremely uh, knowledgeable and allama and so on. He shouldn't walk in front of him. He shouldn't walk in front of him, he should walk behind him. He should never forgive him in terms of giving him hadiyya, uh, or thanking him and praying for him, making dua for him. So you should always thank them for that because you're benefiting from the seed that they planted. Although you've gone beyond now, you've studied Sahih al-Bukhari, he's only taught you the, 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 how to read Ahsan al-Qawaid, for example, Nurani Qaida or you know, whatever it is. And now you've studied Bukhari somewhere else. Doesn't matter, the seed that was planted for, your, for all the studies later on came from this individual. He then goes on, he says, you know, Allama Sha'arani goes really to the extreme in many of these things. He says, and he shouldn't even marry a woman that he divorced. I mean, this, these kind of things generally don't happen in our communities. But this is speaking about the community when divorcees would never have a problem in marrying again. Now, in our days, a poor divorcee is lucky if she ever marries again. Because of the stigma that's attached to our, in our communities. So, he, so this probably doesn't apply to us, but it gives us an understanding of what he says. That if, the, if that sheikh died and he left a widow, you shouldn't be marrying that widow. Which tells us that that was a possibility in those days, but not anymore. Likewise, if they had a position somewhere and they had to uh, leave that position for some reason, you should not take their position out of respect. If it's a position that they did not abandon themselves, but rather they were like uh, evicted from it or they were given a, 
a notice or something of that nature. Because this is where you're getting your spirit from, that's why, that's what he said. Now again, it would depend on a lot of these situations. If, for example, you were in that situation where they had to leave that position for some reason or forced out of that position, if you didn't take that position, then somebody not very worthy would come there then, you know, to save that position. So all of these are general guidances. Just to show respect, the underlying point here is to show respect. So for example, there's a, a Zayd ibn Thabit radiyallahu an. You've heard of Zayd ibn Thabit. He was one of the older. He was older than Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu, but he was considered to be one of the great ulama of the time. He is considered to be one of the great ulama of the time. He was a katib al wahi, very close to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anyway, he approaches one day on a mule. He approaches one day on a mule. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is now later on considered one of the greatest ulama. Uh, among the Sahaba as well. Right? He suddenly stands up, takes hold of the reins of this mule until he helped Zayd ibn Thabit or until Zayd ibn Thabit anhu, came off the mule. So Zayd anhu says that, why are you doing this? He's younger than him. Abdullah ibn Abbas is younger than him anyway. But Zayd ibn Thabit is saying to him, why are you doing this? You're doing this and you're a cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, he's showing respect for the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even though that family member is younger than him. So Ibn Abbas says, هَكَذَا أُمِرْنَا أَن نَفْعَلْ بِعُلَمَائِنَا This is how we've been commanded and instructed to act with our ulama. That we respect them like this. So then Zayd ibn Thabit said to him, come, come, come closer. So he brought him closer and uh, Zayd radiallahu anh kissed Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anh said So Abdullah ibn Abbas said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? You know, what's the reason for that? Out of respect, you know, they generally give them a kiss on the forehead or on the hand This is the way um, of respect Like, Abdul, uh, like Abu Bakr radiallahu anh came and kissed the forehead of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after he passed away So uh, Zayd ibn Thabit said, why did you do that? So he said, this is what we have been told. Sorry, Abdullah ibn Abbas asked, why did you do that? Why did you kiss me? He said, it's because this is what we have been commanded to do with the family members of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So you see the respect is both ways. Each person is finding an excuse for, or has a reason for respect of the other person. This is the beautiful ukhuwa and brotherhood in Islam. That's why there was a, a shaykh whose name was Shamsuddin al Dayruti. He was one of the he was actually one of the teachers of the author. He was uh, an extreme ascetic and uh, known for his great devotion and his worship. But he had a lot of awe and respect. People would be really. Uh, overawed by him all the time the author mentions the author mentions about this teacher of his that when he would give his lessons in azhar in the in the university of azhar at the time his gatherings would be filled with people that would just be constantly weeping and crying that was his effect on the people at the time Anyway, so it's mentioned about this Shaykh Shamsud, uh, Shamsuddin at Dayruti. Once he passed by a jurist, a scholar of the Sharia, and he quickly got off his animal, and he started then um, driving the animal in front, in front of him, and then he kissed the hand of this jurist. And then until he hadn't passed by a distant from this jurist, uh, from this jurist he, he didn't get back on the animal. Even though he was such a great scholar himself, he would respect other scholars like this. Um, he had actually written a commentary of one of the great Shafi'i books, Al-Minhaj. And the jurist that he was just going past, showing all of this respect to, was just a normal jurist that would teach in the maktabs of the time, in the local madrasas of the time. Whereas this man was a specialist but he still had this respect for others. But then as um, 
the author says, There's very few people who would show respect to that level. So again, this is just an example that he's, he's showing here. Okay, this is a, another aspect which is probably more related to people who are advancing in their Sharia studies or in their worship and so on. He says, لا يجلسون للمشيخة ولو اجتمعت فيهم شروطها إلا بإذن من الله تعالى أو من بابه الأعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم من شيخ أو من شيخ عارف الناصح فإن في الإذن البركة والسلام من الآفات مستقبل الزمان والمراد بالإذن من الله تعالى الإلهام الصحيح. Another of the etiquette is that they will not sit to become a sheikh. So somebody goes and studies for a few years. Somebody goes and stays in the company of a great sheikh. For some time, studies with a few scholars here and there, one year, two years, or in their summer holidays, right from their university, and they come back and they become a sheikh. This happens often. Many people like that. You read their bios, it just says they've studied with some of the greatest scholars of the world. Right? They've probably studied in their summer holidays or uh, maybe taken a year off, you know, a gap year from university to go and study with this, and they come back. And because around them there's not many people who are very learned, they become the learned people because they, because they learn to speak in Arabic a bit, maybe. They can quote a few books. They've studied a few books. They've, uh, you know, they've covered a bit of ground. And they sit to for mashikha, which means they sit uh, in this uh, official capacity, in a sense, or in a formal capacity as a, as a sheikh. He's saying that a person should not sit like that. A person should not take up that position. Even... If he has all, even if he meets all the conditions, even if he meets all the general conditions that he has special authorizations in Quran and in Hadith and in Tafsir and in Aqidah and so on and so forth, he should still not do so. Now he's talking about somebody who's gone and studied well and then the person goes and takes up a position like that. We're talking about our situation when people have, haven't even studied well enough haven't even studied well enough and they do this so he's saying that somebody who studied well like that now should they take up that position he says no unless they have permission from Allah how are you going to get permission from Allah where you get a special you feel a special inspiration that I must take this job up and you find it difficult not to so it's a divine kind of intuition uh, uh, inspiration that you get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not from the shaitan or you see Rasulullah in your dream and he tells you to do something like this. Or one of the great shaykhs who are in tune with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they instruct you that you must do this. Because the people here are in need and you must do this. And even though you feel incapable, you do not feel capable at all. You do not feel yourself capable to do this. And the person who's accomplished will never feel capable. Because they will all feel, always feel small in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you need this instruction from someone else. Because if you do do it after this kind of instruction is received from any of these sources, then in that you will get barakah and blessing in your work and you will be safe from afat. You will be safe from calamities. Otherwise a person gets into this position and he gets intoxicated by the respect and everything that people will give him. Now, for many of you, this is one of the signs that you must look for in people who consider themselves scholars. You know, how much have they studied and who have they been authorized by? Otherwise, today in this world of the online world, it's everybody can say something. Everybody can say what they want. And everybody, for everybody, there's going to be somebody that they resonate with and they're going to follow them. And they're going to have a following. In fact, the crazier you are, the bigger following you'll probably get on YouTube. That's the way of YouTube. The crazier you are, the crazier things that you do, the more outlandish things that you say, then you attract that kind of a crowd who's just looking for an excuse. Allah preserve us, Allah protect us. So he says that this is the way where you'll get barakah in your work and you will stay away from calamities for the future. And the, 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 this, is, this is very important. Allah help us. Another of their etiquette is You know this whole, we, before this we had 
this course uh, about um, the Riqaq course, which means the softening of the hearts course, in which talked about the dunya and its nature and so on and so forth. So now, if a person wants to cut himself away from the dunya, what should his intention be? Like if you just get tired of the world, what, why is your tiredness of the world a worthy practice? So that's what he's saying. They do not abstain from the dunya except for one reason. Because it is not liked by Allah. A dunya mabhud. The dunya is not something that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he means by beloved is we still have to be here, but it's not something that Allah loves us to be after. So for that reason alone, not for any other reason. I just don't want to work anymore, I can't bother. You know, I don't care, I don't want the money, because I can't bother. I'd rather rest than sleep. That's the wrong reason, because we're told not to do that, we're not told to be lazy. Or hisabin. I mean, subhanAllah, what a thought. I'm going to have less of the world because I don't want to have too much to answer for on the Day of Judgment. Like, I don't want all these other businesses or whatever because I don't want to have to fill in extra tax forms. You know, because you've got a simple income, then that's it. Done and dusted. But if you've got two, three income sources, then you have to fill in more forms. So it's like that on the Day of Judgment. Now, I don't even know who would have that kind of thought today. But I'm assuming there will be some people who will think that way. That's why he says, not for that reason. Likewise, they should not abstain from what other people have, except to fulfill the command of the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they should avoid looking at what other people have. So they shouldn't do it because if they do that, then people will love them. So you just want to attract the love and reverence and respect of people. That's why you do that. It should be purely for the sake of Allah. So it's, this is all about correction of intention. So the reason should be that I'm doing this because this is what Rasulullah has told me. Then people will love me for that reason. right? People will love me for the reason. And then on the day of judgment, they will intercede for me. If it's for that reason, then that's a praiseworthy reason. That's a praiseworthy reason. But if it's for, oh, I'll become more respected. People will say, oh, look at that guy, he is cut away from the dunya. Now, in this world, the, in this world today, we, have res we, we revere people who have made it big. But then there are a lot of people who revere people who don't care about the dunya either. While other people will look down upon them. What has he done for himself? That's what they say. They just don't understand that the person is so happy in his absence. The person is so happy in his small possession that he has but there will be some people who respect that idea who've got some faith in their heart they will respect that idea that a person is not into the dunya so you shouldn't do it for that reason the next point he makes up he says is that it is also of their etiquette that they keep away they keep a distance from anybody that they see among the ulama who do not act on their knowledge so there are scholars who have studied, but they seem not to act on their knowledge. They do transgressions. They say things which are bordering the reprehensible. They are giving fatwas that seem to be permitting things that have been well known to be haram or wrong or frowned upon. So they stay away from such ulama. They keep a good opinion about them within themselves. They don't think bad about them, but they stay away from them. That's why he says one of his teachers, Sayyidi Ali al Wafa said, Ulama usu adarru al nasi min iblis. The evil scholars are more harmful to people than the iblis. Evil scholars are more harmful to people than iblis, the shaitan himself. How is that possible? Iblis is the worst. So how does a corrupt scholar, an evil scholar, whatever you want to call that scholar, Allah protect us from him becoming that or from being misled by one. That person, that scholar is worse than the Iblis. 
then he gives his explanation, his reasoning. He says, because Iblis, if he gives a whisper, if he whispers to a believer to do something wrong, then that believer will understand that this Iblis is my enemy. He's a clear enemy, as Allah says in the Quran. And if he does end up following that whisper, if he does end up falling for that whisper, he will know that he sinned. At the end of it, most of us will recognize, uh, if, we, if we don't recognize that this is an evil thought from the shaitan and we actually go and do the evil, after the evil has been done, we do realize that we've just done something wrong. We know it's wrong. So then the person will try to make tawbah. He will try to repent from it. So he knows he's done wrong. And he'll try to do istighfar to his Lord. Whereas when an, an evil scholar will corrupt the truth in front of you, show you the wrongest truth, that, oh, it's okay to do this. There's nothing wrong. All these other scholars, they don't know what they're speaking about. This is the rhetoric that you hear nowadays from certain individuals. This is what you hear. Oh, this is completely right. This is the proof of it. This is the proof of it. And these other guys, they don't know. They're just dry scholars. They're just like hermits. They have no idea what they're doing. They're not in the true world. They're not in sync with things. This is, what, this is the way they go about. يُلْبِسُونَ أَلْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ They confuse the truth with the, uh, with the falsehood. وَيُوَرُّونَ الْأَحْكَامَ عَلَىٰ وِفْقِ غَرَضِهِمْ وَأَهْوِيَتِهِمْ And what they do is, they twist the rulings according to what they think it should be. According to their corrupt worldview. Because once you've developed a worldview about something, then you will twist everything to conform to that. One is that you're mistaken, genuinely mistaken about the ruling of something. The other one is that where you've developed a philosophy that you want people to follow and then you will corrupt everything for them. فَمَنْ أَطَاعَهُمْ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُ Anybody who follows such a, such a scholar, such a leader, then all their efforts are in vain. All their efforts are in vain. وَهُوَ يَحْسِبُ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ سُنْعَ While they will be thinking that they're doing good. And subhanAllah, there are people like this in today where... Th- they, they were decent practicing individuals, stay away, staying away from many undesirable aspects. A lot of this is to do with the kind of gray areas. A lot of the corruption starts with the gray areas before it goes in the haram. It's very difficult for somebody to take a complete haram and make it halal. Having a girlfriend is halal. For somebody to say that is extreme. But then... They'll start off with other things like free mixing is okay as long as you keep, you know, you, you do this or you have a pure heart or whatever the case is. You know, dressing in a particular way is okay for men and women as long as they do this, that or the other. They, they will try to make things, they will try to give the extreme possibility in that regard. So this is where people will think they're doing the right thing. That's why so many people who are fine and started following such authorities as such, have, have uh, lost themselves. فَاجْتَنِبْهُمْ He says, so stay away from them. وَكُنْ مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ And always be with the truthful ones. فَإِنَّكَ تَسْتَفِيدْ مِنْهُمُ الْعَمَلِ بِأَحْكَامِ الدِّينِ بِخِلَافِ الْمُتَفَيْهِقِينَ فَإِنَّكَ لَنْ تَسْتَفِيدْ مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا دَعْوَ الْعِلْمِ وَالتَّكَبُّرَ عَلْ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Stay with the truthful ones because they, from them you will get uh, the true impetus for good action. Whereas if you're with those people who are just expressing uh, their virtue rather than having the real virtue then the only thing that you will get from them is that they will claim to have a lot of knowledge they will claim to have a lot of knowledge and they will just be they will just have uh, this arrogant <clears throat> approach uh, to the muslimin uh, in regards to that he says the next adab the next etiquette that he speaks about is kathratu inqibadihim fi nufusihim idha ra'u amran mukhalifan li this is a test of somebody's faith, this one. This is that it's from their etiquette that they will feel an extreme level of uh, internal tightness. When they see something that is opposing the Sharia. When you become used to seeing things that are opposing the Sharia and it doesn't matter to you anymore. It doesn't provide any kind of restriction. 
it doesn't provide any kind of bad feeling and, and it's like okay big deal you know it's it's okay it's the times that we're living in it's all right which eventually happens when you get exposed to it too much it's a natural kind of development that you eventually become totally desensitized to evil when you've seen it so many times and then those things so can so easily come into your own practice because one is that you just have to remove the taboo of it you have to get used to it and then after that it becomes easy for us to assimilate that practice that's why our du'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be that oh Allah show us the truth as the truth and allow us to follow it show us the wrong as the wrong and allow us to abstain from it and to seek uh, forgiveness for all those sins that have come into our life and we, don't, we no longer even think they're wrong any uh, no longer f feel that they're wrong that is probably a very very difficult one is you we know we're doing something wrong the other one is we don't know that we're doing what we're doing is wrong so anyway he says that this is another of their attitudes is that they are constantly feeling extremely um, restricted in themselves and bad in themselves when they see something that is against the sharia why because they have so much respect for allah so much reverence for allah that something is going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though it's happening every day, for them their respect of Allah is so much that they see this as disrespect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they feel compassion for the person who's doing it that the poor guy is involved, this and, involved in this and doesn't realize. He does make a clarification because maybe he was dealing with a lot of these juristic thinkers. So he says that they don't say that this is also an act of Allah because Allah is behind every act so this is also an act of Allah so why should you feel bad about an act of Allah you know because everything's from Allah but that's just taking it to the other extreme because he says that's pure ignorance because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says used to get angry when the Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's rights were violated so yes it is everything Allah is uh, giving the, uh, the power behind everything providing the power and strength behind everything even the evil that goes on in the world in a sense but that doesn't mean that you must be satisfied with evil that goes on in the world because it's wrong that's why the ulama have mentioned that a believer should have pers multi-level perspectives multi-level visions different ways of thinking of things one vision should show him Every, but by that he should be looking at everything that is happening in the world from the divine perspective of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind everything. One is he's recognizing that Allah's power behind everything. But that shouldn't confuse for him good and evil. Evil done by the perpetrator is still even evil. So his other eye needs to recognize that fact. While his one eye needs to understand that Allah is behind everything. But don't confuse the two things together. It's a very sophisticated understanding that needs to be there. <clears throat> so he needs to understand that Allah is behind everything and there's a wisdom behind all of these things. But yet the perpetrator, I'm going to look at him from a different perspective because he's a criminal at the end of the day. Otherwise the murderer is never going to be culpable. <clears throat> the murderer is never going to be guilty. Because if you think Allah is behind everything anyway, then so why should you punish the murderer? The murderer is punished for what he did with his free will. <clears throat> the next point he brings up is غَدُّ basar and فُضُولِ النَّظَرِ Another of the adab of the people of Allah is that they keep their gaze away from things that are redundant to look at, that don't concern them, from extra, from things that are beyond their need. They don't try to get into everything that is around them, but they avoid all of these things. وَالْإِسْرَاءْ فِي الْمَشِي مَعَ السَّكِينَةِ at the same time, the other thing that they do is they try to move forward quickly with their life and in walking, etc. But with tranquility. Number three, Islahu Dhatil Bain. They're trying to constantly reconcile between people. If some issues taken place, they try to constantly reconcile between people. What ta'ami an uyubin nas and they become blinded. They make themselves unaware of what people's uh, defects are. So they're not focused on the defects of people. They are purposely making themselves, putting blinders on. 
I don't want to know. Why do you tell me this? Why should I know? It's not affecting me. Why do you tell me of he's doing this, that or the other? How is it going to affect me? Why do I need to be told? So ta'ami. Ta'ami means to do something by force. To pretend you are blind by force. To make yourself out to be having to, to have blinders on. You don't want to know. And then if you do find out, then to conceal it. To rather spread their virtues. Unless the person is an innovator. Unless the person is guilty of reprehensible innovation. Then you need to tell people that this person is guilty of these things. Stay away from him. You do this out of compassion for believers that they don't also fall into that. It's also actually out of compassion for the person who's an innovator. That you tell people about his bid'ah. Why would it be out of compassion for them? This is the reach of this person's thought, of the author's thought. It is to warn people of a person's innovation. Is compassion for the innovator as well. Because when a person innovates something and he expects people to follow him, he is getting everybody's sin. Because it says, Man sanna sunnah, uh, sunnatan Whoever starts and innovates a new evil path and people follow him, he gets the sin of all of these people. So if you warn people, then there's going to be less people that will follow him and thus he'll get less sin. Because he'll have less followers. وَلَا يَأْثِمُ أَحَدٌ بِسَبَبِهِ And also, other people will not become sinful uh, because of his reason. Now, it's only a person who has compassion for even the sinner that would think like this. Otherwise, where would we think <clears throat> in that regard? This is something that's probably very contemporary, right? But it's a very historical and a traditional thing anyway. Another of the adab is عَدَمُ سَبِّ الْوُلَاتِ وَإِنْجَارُ <clears throat> They do not re- take recourse to swearing, cursing. Saying bad, giving bad names to their leaders, even if they are oppressive. You know, Bush is like this, and Saddam is like this, and this person is like this, and Clinton was like this, and Blair is like this, and and just just go around swearing at them and critic- and and uh, and saying bad, giving them bad names, even if they're oppressive. Why? <laughs> because he turns it around. He says, "لِأَنَّهُمْ مُسَلَّطُونَ أَلِيَنَّهُمْ مُسَلِّطُونَ غَالِبًا." على الرعية ومسلطون غالبا على الرعية بحسب أعمالهم ونياتهم. Generally, you get such leaders over people because of the people's own actions and their intentions. Very difficult for a lot of people to stomach this because <clears throat> people are so geared up about this, especially in uh, many of our Arab countries. Unfortunately, uh, some of the Salaf used to say أعمالكم أعمالكم. Your actions, your deeds are your leaders. How your deeds will be, your refle- that they will be reflected in your leaders. وَكَمَا تَكُونُونَ يُوَلَّا عَلَيْكُمْ The way you will be, that's kind of, the, the, that is the type of person that will be put above you. Then there's a, the question is that مَا هِيَ الْفَائِدَةَ الْمَرْجُوَةَ عَنْ سَبِّ الْوُلَاتِ What are you going to get out of swearing at Blair? He's a F in this and F in that, as some people might want to say. What are you going to get out of it? <clears throat> Is it polite to say F in? What does it mean anyway? It doesn't mean anything. But you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> some people get mistaken that you know we're supposed to do nasiha even for our leaders. So they think swearing at the leaders is nasiha, is an advice, is advice and counsel. So he's saying that look, the, what's the wajib? For people, for alim for example, is that he should give nasiha. When you give nasiha and counsel to somebody, you expect some benefit to come out of it because you're saying some good words. When you're swearing at somebody, cursing someone, then what you get out of that? You're probably going to get a few swears back. Or you're going to get worse back. So what do you get out of that? Likewise, it says, بَلْ أَيُّ شَيْءٍ فِي لَعْنِ الشَّيْطَانِ وَنَفْسِ السُّوءِ وَالدُّنْيَا what do you get out of swearing at the shaitan or the nafs, the iblis, the dunya, whatever? You don't get anything out of that. 
So why would you swear at somebody for no reason? So taking a bad word to your tongue is not a good idea. That's why the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Allahumma la tusallit alayna bithunubina man la yarhamuna. Oh Allah, do not put over us. Do not put over us because of our sins. Those that will not have compassion for us. Those that will not have mercy on us. Because of our sins, he says. So he's saying that we are, have sins, but oh Allah still do not put people above us for that reason because that's a punishment. And this is what might sound very pacifist. Though there will be exceptional cases where this doesn't apply, uh, maybe. But in general, this is the case. That's why even when people came to Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he told him not to fight against the Hajjaj because he said that Hajjaj may be a punishment against you. And how can you fight with the punishment of Allah with your swords? Hajjaj may have been sent to you as a punishment. So why do you fight? How are you going to fight against the punishment of Allah with your swords? That's why Fudayl ibn Iyad makes a statement which is a very, very far-reaching statement. Very insightful statement. He says, لَوْ كَانَ لِي دَعْوَةٌ مُسْتَجَابَةٌ لَمْ أَجْعَلْهَا إِلَّا فِي الْإِمَامِ if I had one dua that was guaranteed to be accepted, if I was given that one wish as such, that was going to be accepted, I would make that for the imam, for the leader. Because if he becomes right, everybody will be in peace. So if I was to give him one da'wah, one, one dua, I wouldn't use it for myself, I'd use it for the imam. That's how important this role is. And that's why we need to change our actions to have a better person above us. May Allah help us. I think we'll finish here. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam at least at their basic level so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially for example the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.